So I am thrilled to welcome today to our first Echo Ties of the 2022-23 school year, Dr. Deborah Schwinn. You may remember Deb in the spring. She uh, gave a great session with Judy Schoonover about uh, participation in the art room. And we're thrilled to welcome her back to talk about a topic that you all are very interested in. I get very many requests about this. And so the role of the related service provider in MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support. And uh, you have will have access to the handouts. I'm going to uh, put that link into the chat box. Uh, but you'll see that Deb Schwinn has uh, all kinds of experience in uh, community-based programs. Uh, she is uh, very active as an OT on a, a local and a national level. She has uh, presented nationally uh, transition, all of the pieces and parts that uh, bring her to our table today. Deb, I'll let you go ahead and, and, and tell us a little more about you as I stop sharing and you start sharing and let's talk MC, MTSS. That sounds great. I will, let's see here. I am, um, I usually encourage everybody to um, answer questions along the way, but um, today I have my neighbor cutting down two trees and um, the cable is going underneath the, the tree. So I've already lost service. So I wanna really get through all of this before something else happens over there. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so today we are going to be talking about the multi-tiered systems of system of supports and the role that we play as a related service provider. And as you can see at the top, there's a lot of acronyms. And hopefully by the end, you will understand what all of those acronyms are. Um, it's a really hot topic, if you will, and it's really at the, the foundational level. So there's a lot of opportunities for OTs, especially since that's what I am, um, have the most knowledge with that. Um, it, it's an area where we have a lot of opportunities to be really creative right now because we're still on the ground floor of this. So hopefully you leave today uh, with a lot of good ideas that you can implement tomorrow. Uh, like uh, Deb said, my name is Dr. Debbie Schwind, and a lot of my uh, research and doctoral studies have really been in the area of transition. That's kind of really my passion, if you will. We're all very familiar with IDEA, and that was the reauthorization of the Education of All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. And um, the IDEA was a reauthorization of that signed into legislation in 1990. It is a special education act. It provides services for students with certain dis disabling conditions who may be found eligible uh, for special education services and who may require um, the assistance and the support of a related service provider. So OTs, PTs, SLPs are considered related service providers. And we really should be providing those services in the least restrictive environment through an IEP where we support goals. We're gonna compare that to ESSA or the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was signed into legislation in 2015. And it was the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act or No Child Left Behind from 2001. And it really focuses on health promotion and prevention and includes school climate. It's actually the largest federally funded education law ever passed. Um, and it is in for students with general education needs. So that is the really big difference between these two pieces of legislation is one is specifically for gen ed, one is specifically for special ed. And one of the reasons why they had this reauthorization with some changes in it is because they felt like there were some unintended consequences of no child left behind where our students were really over tested and overstressed. So now there is state accountability that includes, you know, 
reading and math assessments and the like, but now they also must include at least one non-academic indicator. So it could be absent rates, it could be school climate, it could be discipline, referrals, expulsions, and the like. And it's this legislation that also really promotes these early intervening services or the multi-tiered system of supports. Um, they really want the schools to be a place where students feel safe, um, where they can learn. And that this is where we have this tiered system being brought in, which we're gonna be spending most of the time talking about today. But I wanted to give you a little bit of um, a comparison. And in ESSA, we are actually not referred to as a related service provider. We are referred to as a CISP or Specialized Instructional Support Personnel. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. So an IDEA, again, we're a related service provider, is very caseload um, uh, driven, if you will. Um, whereas a CISP is really kind of more workload driven. The really great thing about the fact that we are a CISP is that we are allowed to provide more input into the whole school population. And it really adds to our evolution in the educational system. It gives us authority to work with gen ed students. And again, ESSA has this focus on prevention of disability and really focuses on looking at behavior and mental health and physical health, as well as academics. So there's also an organization called NASISP, N-A-S-I-S-P, uh, the National Alliance for Specialized Instructional School Personnel, and they have a lot of information on their, their website. So I would really encourage you um, to go to their website. So as OTs, PTs, SLPs, we are related service providers and we are also CISPs. The benefits of having the CIS team is that we are very highly trained individuals. We have a lot of information that we can share about all students and we can collaborate with the whole team, with the whole school division to provide ideas and strategies. And again, OTs, SLPs, PTs, we have this unique knowledge base that can impact all students. And this is just a, a chart that I wanted to show you. It's actually from AOTA, from Abe Saffer, who is um, a lobbyist for AOTA. And it just shows you that ESSA is the most financially supported act in education. And if we are able to wear both hats, a related service provider and specialized instructional support personnel and start providing more tier one and tier two supports, then some of our funding for related services or assists may be able to come from that ESSA pot of money as well. So where did this MTSS framework come from? It really has roots in public health and the wellness and prevention models. Um, at the base is health prevention. That's really considered our vaccinations, well baby checks, blood pressure checks, cholesterol checks, colonoscopies, mammograms, and the like that everybody gets. It's universal to everybody. At the next level is this prevention area. It's preventing illness or disability or disease. It's a level where you have small groups of patients that may get extra help or assistance, such as those with obesity, high cholesterol, um, smokers, that sort of thing. And maybe they put them in exercise classes, smoking cessation classes, um, but that next level is more of a group level. And then that next level is really indicative of more intensive interventions. It's the smallest group of people, and these are the people that have a disease and are receiving medical interventions regularly in order to manage their health. At tier three, you are still getting tier two and tier one supports. So at tier three, if you have cancer, or diabetes, you still are getting blood pressure checks at tier one. You're still getting cholesterol checks at tier one. So remember this model because it does directly apply to education. 
So education has adopted this model and it is typically three tiers. This um, slide was taken from Every Moment Counts and Dr. Susan Basic, B-A-Z-Y-K, is an OT. She has created um, a lot of programs with MTSS and Every Moment Counts is her um, website. So I would definitely encourage you to go there. She has a lot of free resources that we can all use. Dr. Bazaik was our uh, keynote and uh, did sessions for us at our spring conference in April. Oh, that's and awesome. So, yeah, she... And she's, we are talking to her about doing a follow-up session about communities of practice with movement. So she... thank you for that. Yes, she's amazing. Um, and again, a lot of free resources. She was able to get a federal grant, so she does not charge anything for any of her um, online resources. Um, so we have typically tier three three tiers. There are some divisions that you may see have four or five um, tiers. That's just something they have uniquely designed. There's nothing wrong with it, but traditionally it is three tiers. Um, so tier one is that universal design curriculum. It's our core curriculum um, that's implemented consistently across the division. So every child gets it. Um, tier one support may also uh, focus on school climate. Um, and may address school discipline or suspensions, expulsions, school climate, bullying, chronic absences, and those sorts of things. So when we're talking about behavior and those sorts of um, indicators are considered behavior, that falls under something called PBIS or Positive Behavioral Intervention Supports. When we're looking at academics in this tiered structure, we're referring to RTI or response to intervention. And then there's also um, a lot of schools now, especially post COVID are adopting an SEL, social emotional learning or mental health component as well um, to talk about you know, social skills, relationship building, problem solving, conflict resolution um, and the like. So at that tier two level that targeted is small groups of students who may be struggling with some of the tier one universal core curriculum. They're having difficulty learning the concepts, they're having difficulty coping, they're having behaviors that weren't more frequent small group instruction and interventions. They're usually at risk groups um, who may not be making progress academically, behaviorally um, or socially, mentally um, in, in, the, in the class. The final level is tier three. That's the most intensive, very specialized to a very individual, um, usually three to one type of a ratio. It's again, very individualized, very intensive, and it typically does indicate special education. So if you think about a related service provider, Tier three is where we have traditionally been. Um, with this MTSS system, what they're trying to do is they're really trying to prevent students from getting to that tier three level by providing them with supports much earlier. And that's why it has been referred to as early intervening services. ESSA has created a lot of opportunities for us to take on a role as a CISP in addition to our role as a related service provider. So we can have this special ed hat, but we also can wear a gen ed hat now. We can be part of health promotion, health prevention programs within gen ed as a CISP. We can contribute to tier one and tier two interventions. And the thought is that students who are mentally and physically healthy are more likely to succeed academically, socially, and behaviorally. So as a CISP, we can really address barriers to educational success. We can promote, promote positive conditions for learning and can support students' physical and mental wellness. We can work with teachers, administrators, parents every day to ensure that students are successful in school. So as an OTPT SLP, we can have um, a gen ed hat, a special ed hat, an RTI hat, a PBIS hat, mental health or social emotional learning hat, a tier one hat, a tier two hat, a tier three hat. It really expands our roles and our opportunities. Uh-oh, there we go. 
So MTSS is really an umbrella, if you will, that focuses on the whole child. So especially as OTs, that's really part of our training. We have a big mental health background, a big neuropsych, physiology, kinesiology. Um, so we've always had this um, whole child approach uh, because of the unique training that we have. So we can really share our knowledge about typical development that can impact all children in the school. And again, under this umbrella, you see academics up there, which is RTI, you see social emotional, which is the mental health, and then behavior is that PBIS. And at the bottom um, is a link um, that will give you more information. So Abe Sapper, again, is a lobbyist at AOTA, and he is a huge supporter of school-based OTs. Um, he has a vision that all OTs can be an integral part of ESSA as a CISP, and he really feels like we can support students at all tiers. He's lobbying for this. Um, he wants us to be able to support students' mental health needs and physical health needs, um, providing direct services, indirect services, um, as a way to promote this positive school climate and school safety. Um, having OTs part of all kinds of different initiatives, whether it's violence prevention, um, but also looking at more academics where we can remove barriers to instruction and collaborate with multiple people within the school division for student success. And this can be done not necessarily through direct services with the student, although it can be that way, but it can also be done through staff training, through work as a committee member, through co-teaching. Um, doing tier two small group sessions like lunch bunches and the like. And we're going to have a lot of examples. I know traditionally you have a case study. Uh, because this is such a new topic, what I decided to do was really to provide a lot of examples for you. Um, I think that might resonate more than just one case study. So we all understand that there is this big triad, if you will, and interdependence, interplay with these three areas. Um, so if you have a student who's struggling academically, they may have uh, display behaviors, which may then possibly impact their self-confidence and their self-esteem. Um, if we have a student who's had trauma experiences at home and has been exposed to stressful situations, that may develop into mental health concerns, which can then impact behavior, attendance, and academics. You know, a student who might be at home without parental support, maybe the parent um, works evenings and cannot help the student with homework, um, you know, they may start having academic deficiencies and then may develop poor self-esteem. So these are all related. It is the whole child. They all impact each other and they're all interrelated. So this is just one example of how using the occupation of play in the triad can be demonstrated. So really strong play skills um, can impact academics, can impact self-esteem and can impact behavior. But when there's really weak play skills, there may not be opportunities to explore as many toys, um, which can impact academics, behavior and self-esteem. So play is one of our very first occupations, but how can we help promote play for all students using this MTSS framework? And how can we embed our OT knowledge of other occupations in the MTSS framework. So when we talk about this tiered approach, we, we talked again about um, the base level is the population, it's everybody gets it. Um, and that's usually about 75 to 85% of the students will demonstrate progress at that level. Tier two is for students who have demonstrated a lack of progress at that tier one based upon data and uh, based upon you know, cutoffs, if you will, within that data collection. And tier two, again, is for groups um, of students. They may be pulled into small groups to receive targeted interventions. And it's estimated that about 10 to 15% of the students will move into that tier two level. 
and then based upon data collection, probes, um, that sort of thing, some students will move into that tier three level, which again is more intensive, more individualized, and is usually at that special education level. So there's lots of benefits to MTSS. I really compared to doing a task analysis, which is a hallmark of OT. We were the developers of um, task analysis, activity analysis, where we are able to break down skills, which is really instrumental in this framework. So moving from tier to tier is really based upon evidence-based teaching interventions and data with a strong reliance on collaboration. And that in collaboration, again, can include CISPs or us. So again, we have a lot to offer because of all of our different backgrounds. And AOTA and our OT domain of practice also support these tiers. The goal ultimately is um, to promote student achievement for all students through data informed decision making. It, MTSS is an evidence based framework. It does promote inclusion and participation of all children. And again, it does rely on evidence based interventions for struggling students as a way to prevent that tier three um, referral. And one thing I want to mention is that data can be taken anecdotally, um, meaning through observation, through a more qualitative type of means, um, interviewing the teachers, interviewing a team, uh, but it can also be done more quantitatively through progress monitoring, attendance records, absentee rates, uh, different screenings, pre and post test um, interventions, the number of office referrals, suspensions, grades, um, you know, it's a variety of things and it's really individualized to the school divisions and the schools. This is just illustrating that it is a whole child approach. Um, it does look at the whole child. It's focusing on academics and cognition, but it's also looking at the health of the student, the health of the school, the health of the community even, and um, looking at not just physical health, but also mental health. So these uh, slides are from the NACISP um, website and um, AOTA also has these posted on their website. Um, so what does tier one look like? We talked about um, you know, this universal core instruction that all students get. It's the whole school, whole division, whole system. It's really focused on preventing the development of any new occurrences. It can include universal screenings, which everybody gets, and we can be part of that, especially if it's a fine motor, gross motor, speech type screening. Um, I know, they, a lot of school divisions will do these kindergarten screenings for all students. Uh, tier one also includes professional development. So doing a presentation at, at your school on self-regulation, on handwriting, on what is sensory, on universal design for learning, on so many different topics, we can do um, a presentation to our staff at the tier one level that will impact all students. Um, so I, like zones of regulation we'll talk about later, but um, you know, there's a lot of schools who have adopted that for the whole entire school. And what ESSA is really trying to do is increase coordination, increase collaboration and break down silos so that everyone is working with all students in a very preventative type manner to prevent special ed. Again, tier two is a very targeted group. It's small groups of students who are at risk or who need additional help. It's usually five to eight children. Um, and they generally meet in these small groups just two to three times a week for about 20 minutes each time. And there is data taken in those groups. And um, it's usually not taken every single session, but at least one time a week, the data is taken so that it can be monitored to determine if they can fall back down into tier one or if they need to move back up into tier three. Tier three, again, intensive interventions, more one-on-one, -on -one, may only be one to three students. It's um, very explicit systematic instruction and it's daily for about 30 minutes. Uh, data for this level is usually taken about twice a week. And again, it is usually indicative of a disease or a disability. 
um, for this people in the audience who are OTs, um, our occupational therapy uh, practice framework um, for OTPF4 language mirrors this tiered intervention. So a person is used throughout the OTPF4 to indicate tier three, group is tier two, and population is tier one. Uh, so I think it's really nice that it mirrors. You can see it throughout the document. They have adopted this tiered approach as well. So just something for you to refer back to. They have great examples in here in the OTPF4 um, and all of the different uh, categories and uh, occupations that we support. OTPs are, are unique in that we do have this mental health background and this physical health background. So we really do kind of bring some distinct value to the school setting. And also that we are activity-based or occupation-based, which can be um, much more meaningful and purposeful in comparison possibly to maybe the social workers or school psychologists or um, school counselors who may be very talk oriented, if you will. Um, again, our ability to perform activity analysis with so much detail, our understanding of how to break tasks down to scaffold tasks, we really are already doing a tiered approach. Our, these are different occupations that we can address as OTs, and we can provide tiered interventions for all of these um, occupations in the school setting. And we need to remember that school is not just academics. Uh, many of these occupations that we can address are required for our students to have in order to be successful beyond the school doors, uh, for them to be able to do community living, for to have a job, to have leisure pursuits. So there's a lot of non-academic things that we can support and we can use our knowledge of occupation as a CISP now for all students. This is also something that Dr. Basic developed, and it is a great um, infographic, if you will. And it talks about all of the occupations that OTPs support and how we can support them at the tier one or tier two level. And again, this is on the Every Moment Counts website. So please um, go there. So I've said this already that we are unique because of our, our you know, psychopathology background, our neurology background, we're holistic, we understand the interplay of mental health with academics, behavior, sensory processing, self-regulation. Um, we are task analyzers, we're modifiers, we're adapters, um, we use activities to foster participation, and we do have a wealth of information, just like PTs and SLPs have a wealth of information to share with the school community. So I talked earlier about RTI, response to intervention is really academics. It's looking at literacy, reading, fluency, writing, math, and may include some things related to fine motor and visual motor because of um, handwriting and its um, connection to reading and literacy. So that's, I feel like where most OTPs are really um, most familiar with the MTSS framework is through RTI and this handwriting lens, if you will. Um, PBIS is also uh, looking at, is you can be used on this MTSS framework. And again, it's looking at behavior, school rules, behavioral expectations in the classroom and in the school, rewards, expulsion rates, office referrals, recess, um, recess behavior, hallway behavior, cafeteria behavior, bullying behavior, um, those sorts of things, absenteeism, tardiness. And some school divisions are really only looking at um, academics and behavior, but you are starting to see more schools starting to look at mental health. And I'll show you some tiered um, examples of that as well. But before I go on, I wanted to remind everybody that everyone gets this tier one support. And then if we need it, then we can add another support, but you just don't get the ice cream by itself. You still get the cone. And then at tier three, 
you get the cherry, but the cherry isn't by itself. The cherry is still with the ice cream and with the cone. So they're getting all of those supports. And at tier one, universal design for learning is a tier one support. So if the cone doesn't fit in their hand or they can't hold the cone, then we can give them a cup. They don't need special ed to get the cup. Um, so that is just a visual to kind of understand that universal design for learning is tier one. So this is another example of a different school district's um, MTSS framework. They do include PBIS, mental health, academics, or RTI, but they also have social emotional learning and restorative practices. Um, again, every school division is different. So I would really encourage you to look up what your school division's MTSS framework is. It's not really at the state level, it's within the division. So I would encourage you to find out what your framework looks like and what your uh, division is focusing on. This happens to be my division. So they have um, a behavioral, academic, and social emotional learning. And this is a school divisions that separated them out on different um, sheets. So this was an example of what their PBIS framework looked like. I think it's nice when they're all on one sheet because they should overlap with one another and they should support one another. Um, for PBIS, a lot of times what you'll see is in the classroom, the teachers going over um, behavioral expectations for the classroom. Um, you know, what are the behavioral expectations and we respect each other, we respect our community, we, we respect um, the building, those sorts of things. So it's teaching it systematically. So what could we do at that level? Could we maybe make that into more of a visual instead of just words? That would be a tier one support where we are supporting all students because it might be easier for all students to read it visually with pictures instead of with words. So that would be one example. This is um, a quote by two very well-known um, OTs, and I know you're very familiar with uh, Dottie Hanley Moore, uh, but also Mira arendt -Liker. And this is a great quote, the ultimate goal of PBIS is to increase students' participation in school-based occupations, as well as student quality of life. We want them to be able to be engaged with the um, classroom and with their peers so they can achieve. We know when there are less behaviors, there's more engagement. Teachers can really dive deeper into learning for more engaging conversations. And when students have positive behavior, there's improved self-esteem and more engagement academically. Oop, this is always clicking over too fast for some reason. The MTSS model, again, must be very um, integrated and adopted by the whole school division, the whole school team. There must be very consistent core instruction. And there must be universal screenings and um, evidence-based teaching practices. So there's also progress monitoring and data that's taken so that they do have informed decisions about if a student needs to move between uh, the different levels, um, asking, is the student progressing? Do they need more supports? Do they need that tier two support? Um, again, we're trying to catch them before they get to that tier three level. Again, this is just another example of how um, a school division is incorporating SEL into their MTSS framework, especially after COVID, you're seeing a lot more of a, a focus on that. And we know that social emotional learning is a process where students learn skills in order to manage their emotions, make goals, manage stress, display empathy, solve problems, make decisions, and develop relationships. And uh, a quote that Dr. Basic has, which I really love, is she states that, all students have the right to participate in school and to enjoy the school day with positive experiences that can promote emotional well-being. CASEL is an organization 
that provides a lot of resources on social emotional learning. And this is a diagram showing the different components of social emotional learning. If you take a look there, um, some of those are very much related to um, OT specifically, especially our OTPF4, where you're talking about self-management, ADLs, IADLs, and also self-regulation, self-awareness, um, self-advocacy, self-determination, all of those sorts of things, um, social participation. Um, these are all things we need for success upon graduation. And a lot of them include social skills, uh, soft skills, workplace behaviors, and the like. So these are um, from Every Moment Counts. And she really focuses on the fact that every moment has a purpose in school and every moment can count in the school and everybody can do it. We can embed positive mental health into everything we do with our students, whether they're in gen ed or special ed. And we can really build this um, positive mental health every day through these small moments. So it's being positive, it's being active, it's having connections with our students, it's focusing on their strengths. Um, she has a whole list thinking positive, promoting positive self-talk, fostering kindness, creating positive environments, not you know hostile or stressful environments. Um, we can all do this at a tier one level with all students. Again, I, I think I've already said this, but students who are mentally healthy um, have you know much better attendance. They are more interested in being in school. They um, have social connections. Uh, we want our students to be mentally healthy. So these are some ideas for tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, tier one, I've just kind of mentioned some of those, um, just bringing in these positive um, mental health strategies. Uh, some of the other things deal with things like zones of regulation. Some schools have adopted that as a whole school curriculum. We can be on the committee for that and we can provide ideas on that. Prevention might be small groups of students who are at risk. Some of our loners are students with obesity, poverty, loss, divorce, disabilities, trauma, those sorts of things. We could be part of a lunch bunch. They are not students who receive special education. Um, but maybe we could be part of a lunch bunch with them to promote mental well-being and to provide ideas on activities that could be done during that lunch bunch to promote positive peer relationships and friendship groups um, and the like. And then again, that intensive level is really um, for students with a mental health condition, and it usually is provided by a mental health a provider who may actually be outside of the school building and more of a medical um, outpatient um, type office visit. So um, we will go ahead and get into some examples. Um, I don't know if we want to take a break at all, uh, but I can go right into examples kind of um, like our, our multiple case studies, if you will. So typically we have a bit of a break. I know Perfect. we are hoping we I know we are hoping that uh, you keep uh, power and we have prayed to the technology gods. Uh, but does anyone have any uh, questions at this moment, knowing that uh, we will also have question and answer time at the end? Does anybody have a burning question? Well, Deb, I had this down for just an hour, so I'm feeling rushed. Is this extending beyond an hour's time frame? It will always be 75 minutes for our echo sessions, Joanne. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm going to have to leave early. Okay, sorry about that, but we are recording. Thank yes, you. Yes, you will get the recording, so that's not a problem. Okay, well, Deb, I say let's go ahead and uh, any questions, we can certainly address those later. Thank you. Okay, that sounds great. So for Tier 1 and, Art and um, OT, there's a lot of different things that uh, we can do. Um, I talked a little bit about the universal kindergarten screenings. Um, that is fine motor, self-help, gross motor, um, and also speech. 
that many divisions will do. Um, we can help give those screenings. We can review those screenings. Um, some screenings are very, um, I'm going to say the word random, but I don't mean it like that, but they are self generated from the division. So you may even be on a committee to maybe change what they're looking at or how it's worded, um, that sort of thing. So I know many of us are in that handwriting avenue. And so I do a lot of co teaching. Um, in the gen ed classroom. So that would be a tier one support. Um, I have some examples of that um, later on. But if you think about thinking, if, if you, you are pushing into the classroom and they, you want to try to maybe promote SEL in the classroom, we can embed that. We can, um, you know, read the book when we're worried. And we can talk about, do you worry? what worries you what can you do when you're worried embed it and then have the students write about it so it could be done in a gen ed classroom you can bring in history talking about resilience um, in science talking about determination with getting different experiments done and not giving up on experiments um, so you can you can pull in some of these things um, in a tier one fashion kind of through the back door if you will um, but we can also do um, a lot of staff development, self-regulation strategies, again, to the whole gen ed classroom and also um, in services to the gen ed staff, um, talking about alternative seating um, to staff. I have had teachers ask me to come in and talk to their students, the gen ed classroom about alternative seating. So this is a whole list of different things that we can do at a tier one level, you know, promoting recess, promoting activity, promoting um, ADL skills and IADL skills, promoting play skills. Um, all of these things can be done at a tier one level through a variety of means. This is um, cast and uh, there's a link at the bottom these are udl guidelines or universal design for learning guidelines and i mentioned these earlier as a tier one support and basically this is just saying that we really need to think about how our students are engaging um, with the material how we are representing the information and then how they can express themselves and again i use this a lot with handwriting because um, some of our teachers really get stuck on handwriting and I explain to them that we all can do it differently, that just because someone's in a wheelchair doesn't mean they can't participate in PE. Just because somebody has a hearing deficit, um, you know, we don't keep working on trying to get them to hear. We give them a hearing aid. If somebody can't read, we don't keep giving the, or I shouldn't say read. If somebody can't see, we don't keep giving them a traditional book. We give them Braille. But for some reason, when some of our students can't do fine motor, we keep making them write. But they have other alternatives. They can type. They can voice type. There's a lot of other things that they can do. And those are tier one options and tier one strategy. So doing a presentation on that would also be a tier one strategy. Deb, there is a question um, and about tier one and universal supports and the requirement for parent permission. And I'm believing that if, uh, if everyone is given the same screening, that it is uh, not required to have individual uh, permission. Is that correct? Linda. That is the way our division works, but I mm -hmm. would make sure that you get with your division and find out, but we do not get parent permission to do a universal screening. Right. If everybody division, is getting it, then everybody's and, getting it. Uh -huh. Right. And so, Linda, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd find mine. But look, yeah, if all students are being accessed, then a special ed kids just like every other kid and have the ability to take those universal screenings. So, yeah, I agree. And uh, Tanya uh, is asking, does uh, somebody need to have an opportunity to opt out if they don't want to participate? Um, I would assume 
but again, that would be something within your own division. And I think that is what is so fun, if you will, about this is that we are at the ground level. So, um, you know, some of these things are developing and we have input into how these things might be able to evolve. And if they are things that are screened for and then um, uh, strategies and interventions or um, strategies mostly are, are implemented, then all students are going to be able to uh, benefit from them. The screening that the parent might opt out of um, might just be something that really targets their own student. Would you say that or? I guess it would just depend upon the results of the screening. Um, so. I'm not sure so we can't to, make that a blanket statement. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that one. <laughs> so, um, I but parents would opt out of this universal. It just gives the team less general ed team less information to guide that student's instruction. So it makes it harder if a parent doesn't enable a child to participate in these universal screening processes. Right. I mean, it could actually be a barrier because if something did arise from it then we don't know. Um, so yeah, UDL is also um, great. It's very inclusive. It can really mitigate some social injustices. It um, helps students with limited English proficiency. And I think a great example of this is, you know, 10 years ago when we all did not have Chromebooks. I know in our division, all students have Chromebooks now. And, you know, 10 years ago when that wasn't the case, we had to put in that they had access to typing or keyboarding. They would have to go sit at the back of the class and go on the desktop or the, you know, and it was very isolating. It was very obvious that this student could not type. So it really did pull out and, and highlight, spotlight students with disabilities. Whereas this, um, Everyone has a Chromebook, everyone can type, everyone can do voice typing. So it does really kind of mitigate some of these, um, you know, injustices, if you will, disability injustices. Thank you. And I see that Manaz also has a hand up. You have a question, friend? Not so much a question. I just was going to clarify when I think of tier one and I think of whole classroom, I'm coming in and like offering the teacher some universal strategies such as room environment, um, maybe some concepts of how to hold a pencil, how to support that, how, you know, different ways of um, supporting writing using like um, a slant board or sandpaper, you know, just really just that very universal, some more in services, maybe going in, um, talking about making sure that the seats are appropriate heights and desks are appropriate heights. So I don't think of it so much as screening every student as much as providing it more to the teacher and the support staff at that level. And then yep. if I, uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Okay. A lot of the universal screenings are more kindergarten um, as they're first coming in. So working with the teachers, co-teaching, providing strategies that all students can benefit for, from are absolutely all tier one interventions. You're absolutely right. Did that help? I guess so. Um, so tier two, um, again, are targeted at risk groups of students. Um, they may have reading delays, math delays. There's something at um, that tier one level that they're having difficulty with. Um, there may be mental health concerns because of situational stressors that they're experiencing, maybe divorce, a death in the family, uh, friendship difficulties, bullying that they're experiment, e experiencing, um, and the like. But it also may include students who um, may have a military family background where the dad or mom are deployed, so there's an extra level of stress, or maybe they've moved around a lot, which also um, can be stressful. Um, it may be students with increased stress or anxiety, but may not have an IEP. And there may also be students at the tier two level who 
um, you know, may be having difficulty academically, behaviorally, mentally, and who may have some type of diagnosis like ADHD, but do not have an IEP. They're not in that tier three level. Maybe it's very, very mild CP and they don't really have any academic impacts for an IEP. So some small group activities may be handwriting supports. So I have pulled some um, students in um, a second grade classroom, a first grade classroom, and a kindergarten classroom who were not in special ed, uh, but were having difficulty at that tier one level. And so we did more, um, you know, intensive repetition. It's kind of reinforcing what the teacher is doing. I'm not really wearing my um, OT special ed hat and, and, you know, bringing in any type of specialized type of things. I'm reinforcing what the teacher is doing in the classroom. It could also be tier two, could also be after school clubs. I've been involved in several different um, after school clubs. Um, I'm not promoting that. I'm not saying that you should do that, um, but I have um, done that as well. Again, and then tier three individualized, um, special ed, it's kind of what we've always um, been doing. So now we're gonna get into some very specific examples, if you will, more of these um, multiple case studies, if you will. So this is an example of um, tier one doing second grade cursive co-teaching. Uh, the teacher had not taught cursive. It kind of went by the wayside. Now it's kind of coming back. And she really had not taught it in a while. So she asked if I could come in and co-teach it with her. Uh, that was actually really, really fun. Um, we did all kinds of multi-sensory things, had shaving cream on their desk, whipped cream, sand, beans, um, did wiki sticks, cursive writing, pipe cleaner, cursive writing, um, and the like. Uh, we did ghost writing on the back, everyone sitting in a circle. Um, and then also doing kindergarten handwriting, co-teaching. We are a learning without tears or handwriting without tears um, school division. So um, I've done quite a bit of co-teaching at that tier one level for that. Professional development. Um, I'm sure many of you have done a lot of different types of professional development on a variety of topics. So looking at sensory strategies in the classroom, different transition topics, self-regulation, universal design for learning. Uh, we can go on and on about all the different things that we could potentially do a um, presentation on that will help all students and gen ed teachers. This was an alternative seating whole class program uh, that we did. And this was really a teacher who was having a really difficult time actually with classroom management and was having referrals to the office, um, having a lot of disruptions in the class. And she also felt like it was starting to contribute to low test scores. So we went in and did an alternative seating program um, for the whole class. And um, she, she really felt like it was extremely beneficial and she started really incorporating a lot more movement into the class as well as a result which was really fun she would um in third grade they do um, animal life so she would pass out pictures or words and um she really tiered that as well because she had some really low readers so she would have a picture of a lizard the word lizard on a card and then the definition of a lizard or characteristics of a lizard and then she did the same thing for mammals birds and then the students had to get up and walk around and find their other people that had cards that were associated um so it, it was great reinforced academics more social participation it was actually really fun this is probably one of my favorite things um, we've done um, whole class morning yoga uh, because of just the difficulties with transitioning in to the classroom unpacking that sort of thing um, so doing a whole class yoga um, uh, kind of like 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes just to get them settled so that they are able to move into academics. But this um, on the left hand side are something that two OTs in Richmond came up with. They call them playscapes. And they were 
having a lot of issues with behaviors on the playground and their data was based upon office referrals and um, different types of physical, um, you know, hitting, uh, pushing, chasing type activities that were occurring because the kindergarten playground was just a blacktop and they had hula hoops and chalk and balls. But after a while, you know, after the first week or two, as boring. And so they came up with this idea of playscapes and they created these theme activities. It was for all the kindergartens at that school building. And what they found is that there was a lot more acceptance and inclusion of their students with disabilities because then all students could play. Not everybody could play with a hula hoop, not everyone could bend down and play with chalk, but they had different um, themes. So this was obviously a construction theme, but then they had a dinosaur theme and it had a volcano on it. And it's, it was really, really cool. And they also noticed a lot less behaviors, a lot less office referrals. This is just another example of um, whole school yoga. Um, it's just on the morning news show. So the whole school was getting it at the high school level um, and also coming up with ideas on how to, um, you know, do movement in your seat in the classroom. And the students in my classroom that I was also supporting a self-contained classroom wanted to participate in this yoga, um, but we're having a really difficult time. So I went into that classroom, we reinforced it. We um, added a PowerPoint, we added these extra um, books that they could refer to. Um, so that was a tier one that was um, also allowing my tier three students to um, to access it. This is a word study moves program. This was for second and third grade. Um, they were having a really difficult time. Um, and I would say that this was really an RTI and a PBIS type of initiative um, because behaviors in the classroom were impacting their ability to do word study. Um, we support a program from UVA called word study. It's basically spelling tests. Um, but they, it's a very programmatic, um, structured way that you implement the program and every day you do something different. And a couple of the days they have to spell the words. And so we started incorporating movement into that. So they had to do wall sits and spell the word. They had to do chair push-ups while they're spelling the words. Um, we had these exercise bands and their bands that they were using to spell the words, but they were also doing long vowel sounds and short vowel sounds. They were doing syllables with it. So it was a way for all students in that gen ed classroom to have access to movement, if you will. And then whole school jobs, I really encourage everyone to adopt um, whole school jobs um, uh, programs. And it really does change the culture of a school, increases acceptance of all students with all abilities. Um, we have gardens, we have whole school composting um, that we have gen ed and special ed students doing in the building. And we have library jobs that um, our fourth and fifth graders are doing, again, gen ed and special ed. And um, we have some delivery type of activities as well. So last year, I was part of a tier one whole first grade fine motor bin um, initiative because um, the first grade teachers, after our students had been home with COVID for two years, noticed that our students could not use their hands. It wasn't just holding a pencil or writing. It was, they could not unzip their backpack. They could not unlock their Ziploc bags for lunch. They could not depress the soap dispenser. And the teacher was having to spend an extraordinary amount of time helping them with these fine motor tasks. In addition, there was impacts to writing. Um, but what we did was every week I changed out the bin. I got a grant for it and it was always steam related. It was either a math or a literacy type of activity that had fine motor embedded into it. And these are just some examples that were in there. And here's some other examples as well. Um, 
So we also embedded social emotional learning into it. So for example, um, in October, they did scarecrows, they had Play-Doh, they rolled out different scarecrow faces. Um, you know, how is the scarecrow feeling? He's sad, why? What can he do to change that? Oh, he's happy, what's making him happy? Um, and the like. But one of the first grade teachers um, wrote to me afterwards so I could send information to the grant provider. And she said, the fine motor kits that you produced were engaging, creative, and exactly the type of activities our little learners needed. The improvement in handwriting was remarkable. Even the parents were impressed with the penmanship they saw by the end of the year. One thing that the parents could not see in our classroom, but I noted, was that the children were more capable of independent daily activities, like opening snack packages, zipping up jackets, and using small game pieces and manipulatives during center time. From the very beginning of the year, the students were excited to participate in the activities, and as the year progressed, it was wonderful to see their pride and their writing as each week showed improvement. The kids were so engaging that even my high school volunteer loved to see what new adventure was waiting for her to enjoy with my students. Um, so that was, again, tier one, every single first grade classroom um, got those bins. I talked a little bit earlier about um, whole school adoption of zones of regulation, uh, the alert program, how does your engine run? We've also done whole school social thinking, social detective, um, um, school ad ad adoptions, if, you'll, if you wanna say. Um, and I've been part of those um, initiatives and um, committees for those. This was the social thinking or social detective that I was uh, talking about. This was specifically in a second grade classroom. And um, I had my um, OTD student um, go in and provide some extra activities that were a little bit more engaging than what was being done with just having stories read and the characters being talked about. So on the right, they were doing the character Mean Jean. Again, this was a second grade gen ed classroom. There were some special ed students in there um, through for cross cat support. Um, but Mean Jean always says mean things. So every time a student said something mean, we put a coat on him. And before you knew it, after four or five coats, the student couldn't even stand up anymore to demonstrate that that weighs heavy on you. It, it doesn't feel good. So then the student started saying positive things and we took a coat off and then they were standing up proud. So again, just talking about how important positive words are and being a friend how important it is to be a friend. Uh, tier one whole school classroom expectations, again, PBIS, um, taking care of our classroom. Um, it's expected that we clean up after ourselves. And again, these are things that the whole school adopt, adapts. Um, and we can go in and provide supports for students who um, may get special education, but it is a tier one whole school uh, program. This is an example of a whole school cafeteria program where uh, we did assemblies. We were having a really difficult time in the cafeteria. Um, you know, just really loud, people getting up, falling, spilling. It was a disaster. So this um, example shows you a very traditional PBIS rule expectation chart, uh, respect for self, others, and property, and how do we demonstrate that? What is the expectation? So we did um, an assembly on this and um, presented it to the whole school. There were whole classroom and whole school rewards. You know, if they did it, the principal, you know, got to have a pie in his face or those sorts of things. So this is actually really fun. This is a tier one uh, support, but it started off as a tier three support. And it started off for a student of mine who was in second grade, who was having a really difficult time at recess. And so we came up with this book for him of things he could do at recess instead of pulling people's hair or kicking them, that sort of thing. He took this out to recess with him 
And everyone started coming over to him and wanting to read his book and do the activities in the book. So what the teacher asked, she said, could you make a couple of these and I could put this in our classroom library. So then after every year after that, um, she used this as a tier one support. And uh, the next example is a different student, but it's indoor recess. And it's the same thing. It started off as a tier three support for a student who was having a difficult time at indoor recess, I think partly because it's loud during indoor recess, uh, but also because he really gravitated towards things that spin, which is not a problem until they start flying off and hitting some of the other students in the classroom. So again, same thing, we made a book. These are all the different things that you could do. These are the different things you could make. All the other students started coming over to it and wanted to look at it. So it became a tier one support. We made multiple books of these and put them in the classroom library. In the middle school, uh, there's a big push for developing leisure skills through our health and PE classes. And most of the um, handouts are all words and many of my middle school students cannot read. So I worked with the health and PE teachers as a way to try to come up and adapt this so that they could access this uh, tier one curriculum. And then this is just UDL alternative pencils instead of writing um, something we could type it we could turn it into a comic book we could turn it into a book creator um, all kinds of different things to show our knowledge in different ways um, to show our knowledge in different ways does not require special ed it's a universal design for learning uh, practice. And art, um, I work really closely in the art room and many of you heard me talk last year about art. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do in art coming up with the, the um, expectations in the art room, um, PBIS, but also uh, breaking down the um, assignment and providing a visual for all of the students. It's also using an overhead camera to show the steps up on the board so that all students can see it. It was originally done for a low vision student, uh, but then the teacher was like, you know what, I think everyone's benefiting from this. Yes, they are. So it became tier one. She demonstrates now for everybody on the overhead camera the document camera. And she has also created videos um, of every of all the projects and all the steps. And what has been wonderful about that is for our students who are sick, who are absent, who have memory issues for a variety of reasons, um, everyone has access to these videos. So that is a tier one support that all students can benefit from and she's doing it for all students. So this is just a review of pretty much all of the tier one ideas that we have talked about and maybe some other ideas as well. Um, that you can do as a CISP. Um, so we talked about, you know, all of these, it just goes into a little bit more detail for you. And then we'll talk about some tier two examples. So um, in a first grade classroom, I have pulled some students to do some tier one supports. Deb, just and to let you know, we have about three minutes left to our session today. Okay, that sounds good. Tier two is much shorter um, because it is a smaller group. And um, so anyway, th most of these things are very self-explanatory through the pictures. So I will go through them quickly. Um, emotional regulation group, um, pulling them. Um, and some of these can be done um, during um, indoor recess, it could be done after school. Again, I have done a lot of things after school. Um, I will work really closely with the school counselors, which is what this was, um, working with school counselors on coping strategies for um, some young, very young um, students. This was a peer buddies club or friendship club where we were um, re- um, emphasizing the zones of regulation and social detective. Um, so we were doing games. Again, um, one of the characters is not a very good loser and does not say nice things. So we were talking about what happens when we lose and we were playing games in this club. 
this is an after school music club. Um, it was actually uh, for, uh, I was supporting a student in there who does have uh, special education, um, but I was providing this in a small group and it was not any type of special ed group. It was an after school music club. And um, so I adapted some of the music materials for him and he's in high school now and he is in the high school marching band. He has Down syndrome. So then it was very successful. So these are just some other ideas that you can do for tier two. Again, tier two is a little bit more frequent um, and you're taking data a little bit more um, closely. Tier three is special education again. Um, so that is um, kind of what we're already doing as a related service provider. Oops. So there's a lot of positives to tiered supports, um, which again, you can read here. It's pretty self-explanatory and there are barriers. And some of those barriers really do include time, especially if you work for a school division where you are a contracted position and you're really required to have billing minutes, if you will. Um, this might be more of a difficult um, framework to support in that type of position. Um, and it also does require a lot of time to collaborate if you're on committees, if you're doing presentations and those types of things. So there's a lot of different things that we can all do and we can impact academics, we can impact behavior, we can impact mental health so that all students can be successful. I think we did it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get, get to go into as much detail about some of the tier two, but they are all there and it's self-explanatory. Wow. <laughs> Chandra, you can stop the recording and uh, 